Our next step is to look at the other types of organisms. So everything on our planet other than animals, because I know that animals are things that you probably have the most familiarity with. And so we're going to focus on some other organisms for a little bit and look at the unity and diversity and structure and function in those guys. And I know that you guys are all capable of reading. So um, to uh, uh, for sake of time and for sake of hopefully keeping your attention, we are going to kind of breeze through some of this stuff um, and just hit the highest points on our way through. So again, most of our year, we've really focused on eukaryotes and we've focused on animals, and that's because that's what we are, right? Um, but today we're going to you know, take a little break from that to uh, appreciate all the different species that are out there because as we, as we touched on way back in like chapter 5 or chapter 4 or something, um, all organisms in our ecosystem play some kind of role, and we don't know how important that role is uh, necessarily. And so uh, we're going to take a little time here to look at those other types of organisms too. So we're going to start with the bacterial kingdom. Uh, so not only um, uh, you know, are, are we going to look at other things that are different, we're going to go as far away from us as we can, which are the bacteria. Um, and we mentioned prokaryotic cells first semester, right? cells that don't have a nucleus. But I want you to know a little bit more than that, too. Right? So bacteria are um, single-celled organisms, right? so unicellular organisms uh, that lack a nucleus. Again, that's what a prokaryote is. And they don't have any of the other organelles either, uh, with the exception of ribosomes. right? And, and hopefully you remember that every type of cell needs ribosomes because ribosomes make proteins. That's right, good. Um, now, in terms of reproduction, bacteria perform binary fission. So this is a form of asexual reproduction. Um, and fission means to split apart, right? And so uh, this fission takes place and it splits into two, as you can see here in this picture. Uh, so two gives us binary, right? Binary fission. Uh, this, uh, in essence, is similar to mitosis. But it is different because it's not quite as uh, well structured or kind of well planned out and organized as eukaryotic mitosis is. Uh, and then when we think about bacteria too and how we mentioned them first semester, um, they are primary decomposers in our ecosystems, right? So they play a very important role for us in terms of recycling organic nutrients uh, back into our ecosystem, uh, basically after organisms die and decay. Now, bacteria do still have uh, DNA. Um, it's actually, uh, uh, they typically have a single circular chromosome. So it's double-stranded like ours, but it's a loop of DNA. Um, and it's kind of just found wadded up in the middle of the cell in an area referred to as the nucleoid. Um, now, the other interesting thing about bacteria, and you can see it up here in the upper right, is that they have things called plasmids which are extra little pieces of DNA. We don't have this, right? And, and what makes this really cool is that plasmids can pass from cell to cell. We call this conjugation. So basically, like one bacterium, right, can actually pass a plasmid to a second bacterium. This is how bacteria transform, if you can remember uh, Frederick Griffith from way back in genetics who studied those bacteria that were like giving the, the rats uh, or mice pneumonia, right? Transformation takes place because organisms can pass plasmids or these, these bacterial organisms can pass pas plasmids from one bacterium to another. In other words, and this is totally awesome, bacteria can pick up new genes, Right? We can't do that. I mean, we talked about that a little bit in genetics. Like if you're born with a genetic disease, you have it. Um, we can't change your DNA. Bacteria can by moving plasmids from one bacterium to another. It's pretty cool. Now the bacteria also come in all different shapes. And, and in fact, a lot of times the shape of bacteria, whether it's sort of like a, a pill or maybe it's round or maybe it's a cool little squiggly looking thing. Um, the shape actually contributes a lot of times to the scientific name of the bacteria. Um, the other thing when we look at bacteria is that they, they can get their energy in a lot of different ways. 
So we talked first semester about heterotrophs and autotrophs. Bacteria kind of rewrite the book on this. Um, as you can see in this chart, and this is not something for you to like memorize at all. It's just for some, you know, just for information here. Uh, bacteria can be heterotrophic like us. They uh, digest organic molecules in the environment. Again, they're doing this uh, through decomposition. Um, but, you know, an example of this is called Clostridium. Um, but there's a whole lot of these out there. Uh, a little bit smaller groups, though, can do combinations of the things we learned first semester. So you've got photoheterotrophs, which not only decompose and ingest organ... Uh, uh, you know, ingest organic molecule, excuse me, um, from the environment, they also can do photosynthesis with light. There's a cool aquatic bacterium called Chloroflexus that does this. Um, some are photoautotrophic, so they do photosynthesis, or similar to plant photosynthesis, use light for energy. There's something called anabina that does this. And then others are chemoautotrophic, which means that, uh, you know, they, they can... Uh, gather energy in a, in a different way, and that's uh, through various chemical reactions that involve sulfur compounds and nitrobacter or bacteria that, that grow around root systems of plants, and they will have a tendency to be chemoautotrophic. Now, we can't talk about bacteria and not bring up some interesting information about how they interact with you, right? Um, most people hear bacteria, they think germs. Right? Oh, you know, this makes you sick. This is why we wash our hands, all that good stuff. But I want to make sure I, I, I'm doing you a disservice if you leave my class without realizing that the vast majority of bacteria do not infect humans. So in other words, the vast majority of bacteria do not cause disease. Most of them do other things in our ecosystem that are helpful to us, right? Decomposition being one big thing, but... Also, we have a lot of bacteria on us and in us that we refer to as our normal flora. It's really crazy to think about, but you are made of way more bacteria than you are human cells. There's just trillions of bacteria growing on your skin and in your body right now. And we call this your normal flora, and it's good for you, right? The ones that some people do know about, you know, there's bacteria in your gut right now that are helping you digest food. Without those bacteria, you can't digest food that you eat. Um, you've got bacteria on your skin right now that are keeping your skin healthy. Believe it or not, um, you know, uh, particularly in teenage years, I know I dealt with it, you have acne and things. Well, it would be a lot worse if you didn't have good bacteria on your body actually getting rid of some of those bad ones that try to cause things like, like pimples. Um, now, all of that said... And, and that is, it's a really important takeaway, for me at least, that, that you realize that most bacteria, not harmful. But some are, right? Some can cause disease, and we call these pathogens, or pathogenic bacteria. Um, now, uh, just to name a couple here, and, and if this intrigues you, there's a whole big unit on this in our biomedical science elective. Um, but some of the bacteria that are pathogenic, and this is... A huge list, so just naming five doesn't uh, doesn't do justice here. But um, Streptococcus pyogenes, most of you have probably had before. All right, Streptococcus actually is a reference to its shape, um, and then pyogenes is actually a reference to pus. Believe it or not, which is gross, I know. Um, but again, I underlined this on purpose. Most of you have probably had this before. This is what typically causes strep throat. And you see that up here in the picture here um, at the top. Uh, second one here, another thing that most of you have probably had before, Staphylococcus aureus is a, this cool purple one here. Um, this is a, a staph infection. Now, a lot of times people have heard of staph infections before, like it's a really bad thing, and it, and it can be. Um, there's also staph that are antibiotic resistant, so they, they are not killed by most of our medicines that we give. But... Also, just realize that staph is on your body right now, and that staph is typically responsible for something like a, an infected hair follicle. So, if you've ever had a little infected hair follicle on your arm, kind of like a little pimple thing on your arm, or maybe on your leg, 
Um, that was probably a really minor staph infection, and then it just clears up and goes away. Um, some other things that I hope you have not had. Right? Um, uh, this one's kind of fun, mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, uh, now this, let's see, I believe this is actually this bacteria. Um, uh, this one's weird. Mycobacterium is actually a reference to fungi, right? Myco is a, is a fungal word root. So this is uh, somewhat fungus-like, but I don't think uh, it's too hard to figure out what disease it causes. It causes tuberculosis, right, which is a severe infection of the lungs, and um, you've all had a TB test before, which is a test for this bacterium um, in your body. Um, another one that might not be quite as obvious what the disease is is Clostridium tetani, which is this weird-looking guy here. Um, this causes tetanus. Right? So you've also probably had tetanus shots before in your life. Um, tetanus is very scary. This bug, if you don't have tetanus shots, can, uh, uh, can cause your muscles to become uh, technically paralyzed, which means um, they are flexed, right, or contracted. So think if you ever had a charley horse before. Now imagine if that charley horse and your calf muscle that you got was every muscle in your body, and that's what tetanus can be. Um, and the last one is maybe just my favorite name ever, um, Borrelia burgdorferi, which is this weird squiggly bacterium over here. Um, anybody know what Borrelia burgdorferi causes? causes Lyme disease. Now somebody out there is like, wait a second, I thought ticks cause Lyme disease. That's not true, right? Ticks just carry this bacteria, Borrelia burgdorferi, in their saliva. And then if the tick bites you, it might kind of implant this bacterium into your body, um, which causes Lyme disease. Now, basically, a, a bacterium is a pathogen if it multiplies rapidly, so if it, you know, multiplies really quickly in your body, and then it creates toxins, which damage your cells in some way, and that's the disease that then you exhibit. Now, we can't talk bacteria and pathogens without bringing up viruses, especially under our current circumstances that we are in right now. Um, however, I do want to make sure you realize that viruses are not living things. Viruses are not cells, and technically they are not alive. Um, the main problem with viruses, so to speak, I don't know if it's a problem, but the issue with them in terms of life is that, uh, if you see in this third bullet here, they can only reproduce by infecting a living cell, right, a host, and taking over that cell's reproductive machinery meaning that viruses cannot reproduce alone, all right? So cannot reproduce independently. My handwriting is stellar on this iPad. Um, so that means they're not living things. I remember one of those the classification, uh, or one of those uh, uh, categories of all living things is, is that it, or criteria, excuse me, of all living things is that they, uh, you know, have to be able to reproduce. And, and so uh, we've known about viruses for a long time, like you can see here, 1897, um, but we really didn't understand them for about 100 years later, right? Or not quite 100 years, but um, where we realized, okay, these are just little protein nucleic acid pouches that uh, are parasitic, right? They infect host cells. And they take them over. And so you probably remember the bacteriophages that we learned about earlier this year. Um, and that's what we see in this picture. And what they can do is inject their bacteria in here uh, and use the host cell to create new uh, viruses. All right. And so this injected genetic material can be DNA or RNA. Um, but what a virus does is it uses that host cell to make more viruses. And what that typically does is it kills that cell, that host cell, and allows the spread of many more viruses throughout the body. Now, viruses cause disease. Um, they might not all cause human diseases, right? So like I say here, many viruses cause diseases in humans. Um, a lot of viruses are on our planet and they don't cause disease in us. Um, but uh, 
one thing that's interesting about viruses is they don't have a uh, scientific name, right? They, it's because they're not technically living things. We don't assign them a genus or species or any of those other taxa. So we don't have a scientific name for them. They just have more of a simple name. Um, I listed some common pathogens here, some common viruses. Uh, again, some of which you probably had, some of which you probably haven't. But uh, rhinovirus, this is the number one cause of the common cold, so we all get this almost annually, or some type of that. Um, interesting here, uh, we've looked a little bit at coronavirus in our assignments previously, but, you know, coronavirus typically causes the common cold, um, but if you get a, a particularly weird mutated version, like we have right now, um, coronavirus can be much more severe, and so, uh, you know, currently we're under this, this COVID-19 pandemic. This is caused by a particular type of uh, coronavirus called the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, um, and uh, uh, again, this is just a strange mutant version of this, but typically a coronavirus also this causes a cold. Um, influenza virus causes the flu, so many of us have had this before in our lives. Um, Varicella zoster, anybody know what that causes? It causes the chicken pox, but it also later in life for people can cause shingles, if you've heard that before. Um, when I was growing up, everybody got chicken pox. You got it once and you didn't get it again. Uh, you guys have had a vaccine for that available since you were kids, so you probably just had the shot. Um, hepatitis, there's different types of hepatitis, right? Um, a, B, and C, and this can be a very dangerous infection. Um, uh, severely affects your liver, hence the name hepatitis. Uh, West Nile virus, you probably heard of. This is uh, carried by mosquitoes, right? So mosquito-borne. Um, West Nile virus causes a, a weird uh, fever disorder um, seen in other parts of the world first, and now it is seen in our part of the world as well. Uh, carried by mosquitoes, so something to watch out for a little bit, a reason to avoid mosquito bites. Um, and then HIV, right, the human immunodeficiency virus, you've probably heard of before. Um, very common sexually transmitted, or uh, today a lot of times it's more about dirty needles, right, so it's um, uh, transferred intravenously between people. Um, but it does exactly what it sounds like, human immunodeficiency. It, it causes your immune system to fail, um, and after a period of time, if, if HIV infection leads to a uh, very deficient immune system, we say that the person has AIDS, or autoimmune deficiency syndrome, excuse me, acquired immune deficiency syndrome. A um, couple other things here in the picture that are interesting. Um, rotavirus causes a kind of diarrheal disease. Um, avian influenza or bird flu, this happened a few years ago. Uh, I think I was kind of a young kid when that happened, but it's an outbreak in Asian countries. Um, Ebola virus, you've probably heard of. I think it was 2014 was the big Ebola virus outbreak in Africa. Um, very scary. This is a hemorrhagic fever. Ebola virus can cause you just to kind of bleed out of your pores and, 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 and causes death and, and most cases. Um, tobacco mosaic virus is something that's studied a lot in research labs. It does not infect humans. It, as it says here, it infects tobacco plants. Uh, bacteriophages, we mentioned uh, previously in class, that these also don't infect humans. They infect bacteria. Uh, here's what the flu looks like. And then adenovirus, really common kind of respiratory uh, virus that um, maybe gives people something that feels like a sinus infection and things, but it's a, a viral infection. All right, now I gotta move faster here. Um, protists are a unique kingdom. They are, are eukaryotes, and typically what scientists say, this is a strange definition here at the beginning, I know, but protists are eukaryotes that are not plant, animal, or fungal. All right, now most of the protists are unicellular, but they actually don't have to be. That's usually how we think of it, that the protists are like single-celled microscopic organisms, but they don't have to be. Um, again, it's just that they are not plants, animals, or fungi. Um, a lot of scientists out there, you can find articles, think that protists should be reclassified. 
Um, the Protoss Kingdom is, is massive and has a lot of different groups in it. Um, a lot of times scientists talk about Protoss as being plant-like or fungus-like or animal-like, uh, which obviously are not uh, Linnaean classification tiers, um, uh, but uh, it allows us to kind of break up the Protoss a little more. Um, but some examples of protists that you maybe have heard of before, like amoeba, which is this picture, uh, paramecia, we had on our previous set of notes, uh, slime mold, which is what this is here growing on this tree, um, brown algae or kelp in the ocean is actually a type of protist, not a, not a plant. Um, and then there are others as well. Uh, protists are a lot like uh, other eukaryotes, they have nuclei, they have uh, all the organelles. Um, there's another picture of an amoeba. Um, you know, they're very typical in terms of eukaryotes. Uh, but a lot of times what they can do is they can move. Um, uh, they are locomotor, so they have pseudopods, which is what this picture is showing you, where they can sort of extend their cytoplasm and then put that down and kind of pull themselves towards it. Um, Protists also are kind of funky. They can they can be asexual or sexual, so um, they can just multiply through mitosis, or um, they can uh, go through a, a you know complicated or kind of complex life cycle that involves uh, sexual reproduction. Um, protists can be heterotrophs or autotrophs, uh, and then protists are um, kind of most well known for being parasites, but I want to even branch out from that. They're, they're really commonly in symbiotic relationships. So again, to kind of review first semester, remember mutualism, right? A lot of parasites, or excuse me, a lot of protists are mutualists. Um, great example of this is termites. You maybe didn't know this, that ter termites can't actually digest wood. You probably knew that termites eat wood or birth, burrow through wood, but um, they actually don't digest the wood. They eat it. And then these protists called trichonympha in their gut tube actually break down the wood. Um, so if you didn't have this, uh, you know, protist inside the termites, they, they couldn't eat wood. Um, and then parasites, right? There's a lot of different parasitic diseases that are caused by protists. These are very difficult to treat in humans because, um, again, these are eukaryotic cells. A lot of times these are cells that are a lot like our cells, and so it's very difficult to get in there and with a medicine or something and kill the protist or the parasite, but not hurt your cells. Um, African sleeping sickness, what this picture is kind of creepy. Look at these uh, these protists growing here. Uh, the, the round cells are your red blood cells, and then these are these creepy, uh, what are called trypanosoma uh, in the blood, and African sleeping sickness is what it sounds like. It's mainly seen in Africa, and it causes people to just become extremely uh, tired and worn out. Um, and uh, it's, it's transferred from person to person, so, so kind of like Lyme disease was transferred by ticks. Um, African sleeping sickness is transferred by these little biting flies called tsetse flies um, that, again, are typically just found in Africa. Now the fungi. So we got two to go here, the fungal kingdom and the plant kingdom. Um, fungi, we often think of as multicellular, but they can actually be single-celled or unicellular. Um, they tend to grow in the soil, right? So they tend to grow from the ground. Um, and again, fungi were, were found to be different than plants because they were heterotrophs. What fungi do is they release enzymes outside of the organism that digests right, extra cellularly, right, digests stuff and then absorbs that stuff. And so fungi are actually sort of like decomposers as well. Um, they break down um, organic matter uh, into smaller pieces and then they absorb that organic matter. So they function a little bit like plants in the soil, but they are not photosynthetic. They are not autotrophs, right? They have to absorb their nutrition. Um, Fungi have cell walls, kind of like plants, uh, but their cell walls have a different structure. Plants uh, are made of cellulose, whereas um, fungal cell walls are made of chitin. Um, if you've heard of chitin before, it's probably not because of fungi, but because of insects. Um, the outer shells uh, or exoskeleton on insects is also made of chitin. Um, 
Fungi are made of unique cells called hyphae, which are long. And, and then a mushroom structure, which is what a lot of people think of when they think of fungi, this is actually a reproductive structure. It's called the fruiting body that grows up from an underground micelle or mycelium. Um, and so you can see in this picture here, mycelium is kind of like a root system. It's not roots um, exactly, but a mycelium can be massive too. So like if you see some mushrooms sprouting in your backyard and you see some on one side of the yard and others on the other side of the yard, it's probably the same fungus with a massive underground mycelium underneath your yard. That's kind of, kind of weird to think about. Fungal kingdom's huge. Over 100,000 different fungi on the planet. Um, fungi generate spores, which allow it to reproduce asexually. So basically it releases spores, and then each spore can become a new fungus itself. Um, already mentioned their decomposers, and then just to keep with the trend here, fungi can also be pathogenic. Right? They also can be a little bit parasitic, um, can be known to infect humans. It's kind of rare, um, particularly internal infections of, uh, with funguses or fungi are, are really rare. Um, aspergillus is, is something that's actually kind of found in the air uh, where we live. Um, and it can cause a respiratory infection or infection of the lungs. It just usually doesn't. If people have a normally functioning immune system, it keeps this from happening. So actually, in, in the medical world, if you see a patient who has like a fungal lung infection, you probably want to check to see if that patient actually has a deeper issue. You know, maybe their immune system isn't working correctly because for most people that would be weird. Um, the one thing that maybe you have had before that is more common is, is skin infections. Right, so athlete's foot is a fungal infection of the foot tissue. Um, athlete's foot is just one version of what's called a tinea. So you can get a fungal skin infection anywhere on your body, and we call it a tinea. Um, but the feet are just most common for that. Um, ringworm, even though it has worm in the name, is actually a fungal infection that kind of forms this little round, raised, kind of scaly, dry patch on the skin. Um, and then dermatophytes, um, these used to be horrible TV commercials about toenail fungus. Um, I don't know if they're on as much anymore, but that's another thing that's a little bit more common that we see. All right, then the, the plant kingdom. So as you can, um, as you'll see here, uh, we're only about halfway through the slides, but I promise I'll try to go kind of quickly through this stuff. But the plant kingdom is, is a kingdom that we understand a lot more kind of like animals versus the others. Um, here's my man Groot um, that my wife and I got to meet at Disneyland back before all this crazy stuff happened. Um, it was really cool. It's probably the coolest Disney character I ever met because this dude, as you can tell in the picture here, this dude's like eight feet tall. Um, so I think he was on stilts or whatever. And then he would talk. He would just say, I am Groot over and over again, but it was really entertaining. Um, now plants are... Uh, multicellular eukaryotes. They have cell walls made of cellulose. As you guys already know this year, they carry out photosynthesis using chlorophyll. Um, you know, but uh, originally, you know, we think plants are older than animals, right? They originated on uh, or in, in aquatic environments, and so probably originated when the earth was completely covered in water. Um, and then over time, talking millions of years here, the, the, the plants evolved to have water collection systems. I mean, they didn't have to be fully aquatic anymore, but that they could grow on land and just have systems that allowed them to uh, gather water from their surroundings. Now, the plant kingdom is kind of different. Um, doesn't always necessarily use the Linnaean system to break things down, so we're not going to use the Linnaean system to break it down either. Um, botanists or you know scientists who study plants uh, typically break the kingdom into five groups, uh, and those groups are are based on basically how um, the plants are structured and how they function. Um, and so, uh, as this picture kind of indicates, uh, we also kind of think that. Uh, these are groups based on uh, their uh, kind of evolutionary development. And so the kind of oldest plants that have been around the longest are the algae, uh, followed then by the mosses, or what are technically referred to as bryophytes. Then we have the seedless 
vascular plants or ferns. Then we saw the development of seeds uh, through evolution, which gave rise to these last two groups, um, which are the gymnosperms, which uh, form seeds on cones, and the angiosperms, which form seeds uh, in flowers and fruits. And so again, this isn't exactly like Linnaean classification, but it does allow us to kind of break things down still. This slide is really important um, and, and looks at something that's really unique, which is the plant life cycle. The plant life cycle is referred to as alternation of generations, and you can expect me to ask you something about that coming up soon. Um, alternation of generations. This is very different than our life cycle, right? So for humans, again, and for mammals, really, we, we are a, a diploid organism, right? And we will create haploid cells strictly for reproduction, right? So we will form sperm and egg that we can then use uh, for fertilization and for reproduction. Plants are totally different. Plants actually have two different life stages. A diploid stage or a diploid organism called a sporophyte and a haploid stage, a multicellular haploid organism called a gametophyte. Isn't that weird? It's almost as though you would turn to something different at a certain point in your life if you had something like this in the, in the human life cycle. So if you look at this picture, right, uh, a sporophyte, which is diploid, will create spores, which are haploid, and that, through uh, uh, mitosis, right, will create what's called a gametophyte. Now then the gametophyte will produce sperm and eggs, which will come together to form a new diploid sporophyte. So that's weird, right? And I don't really like where this is positioned. Meiosis is happening here, right? So the sporophyte does meiosis to give rise to spores. Those become gametophytes, which then come together in fertilization to form a new sporophyte. Um, this is crazy, right? Uh, in a lot of today's major plants, things you think of, right, like a tree in your backyard, for these guys, um, typically what you are seeing is the sporophyte, Right, the, the diploid organism. Um, and the gametophyte is just a, a structure within that plant. Um, so like anything that flowers, right? The gametophyte is actually just going to be a, a part of the flower, essentially. Um, but if we look at some of these more ancient plants, like mosses, which you might also have growing around your property, um, mosses are kind of cool. The, the moss itself, the really you know, low-lying kind of green stuff that's growing on a rock, that's your gametophyte. But then what moss will do at certain times of the year is it'll grow these little vertical shoots, which are the sporophytes. It's a separate little uh, organism, basically, which can then release spores and give rise to new mosses and stuff. Uh, now, algae, most ancient plant, we think. Um, this is typically unicellular, right? This is still aquatic. It cannot grow on land. Um, it can actually divide asexually or reproduce sexually. Um, seaweed, believe it or not, is, um, is a, uh, technically an algae and a, is one of these ancient plants, even though a lot of times it looks a lot more multicellular. Um, also some things that we can look at microscopically are called volvox and spirogyra. Uh, then we go a little further into evolution and we see the bryophytes, the mosses and wart warts. Um, these are land plants, but they don't have true vascular tissue. They don't have tubes inside. So they have to have really close contact with water. So what you're going to see is that mosses and, and the warts, like hornwort, liverwort, are going to grow right on the forest floor. They're going to grow right on rocks like this because they're just going to do this little covering where there's moisture. Um, and in this picture you can see here on the side, they've got these little root-like things called rhizoids, but they don't actually have roots, and again, they don't actually have vascular tissue inside um, either, which means that they have to stay really tiny, and they have to be right on water. 
Now then, and scientists suggest from the fossil record that this is probably about 420 million years ago, so we're talking a long time ago, plants became, became, uh, became taller, and it was because they vascularized. They had these elongated cells, right, these like, almost like straws running through their tissue, which allow them to transport fluids between the tissues. And so maybe in your past you've heard of xylem and phloem. Um, xylem carry uh, fluids, like you can see here, up the plant, while phloem, they usually picture it, phloem carrying fluids down, but it's really more that phloem carry fluids from the leaves anywhere else. So it might be out branches and different stuff like that too. Um, but xylem definitely carry fluids up from the root system into the other parts of the plants. Now vascular plants then kind of take on three different iterations or three different things um, that we see today. The seedless vascular plants would be like your ferns. Um, the ferns have a vascular system, they have a root system, but they don't have seeds. Um, believe it or not, there are 11,000 different fern species. That's crazy to think about. Um, but ferns have these big unique leaves called fronds, right? Um, they don't need a lot of sun, but they do require a lot of moisture because they don't have a, a particularly well-developed uh, root and vascular system. So a lot of times if you have ferns, uh, your parents might like spritz them with a spray bottle or something, which is really good for the fern to stay in moisture all the time, but they actually don't need a lot of sunlight, so they grow well on porches and things like that. Now, the next evolutionary step, again, rough, we think about 360 million years ago, was the production of seeds. And seeds uh, are, are a much better way for plants to reproduce and spread out, right, and, and increase their range, um, and survive on land, right? Because what this allows plants to do, seeds, is reproduce without water, right, open water, don't need a, a pond or anything like that. Um, and like I just said, it allows them to really increase their range. So, in these plants, right, uh, basically, you need a way to develop and disperse seeds. And so we have two groups. The gymnosperms form seeds on cones, and angiosperms form seeds on flowers or in flowers. So, as you might guess, gymnosperms are things like um, fir trees, right? And angiosperms are any kind of plant that flowers. Now, pollen is a unique plant structure that we only see in these seed-bearing plants. Um, the pollen grain basically is, is carrying your, your male cells, your sperm, um, and then the female cells are going to be found in the uh, other part of the plant. So again, the gymnosperms, uh, quote-unquote pine trees, right, conifers, um, they don't really have leaves, right? Their leaves are highly specialized to form these little needles. Um, uh, these form cones to carry their seeds, and what a lot of people don't realize is that there are actually male cones and female cones. Um, what most people think of when you mention a pine cone is this one I'm circling here. This is actually the female cone of, uh, uh, of, a, of a gymnosperm. Uh, certain times a year, and you might be able to find these sometime on plants at your house or something, uh, you will also see these little things. These are male cones, which are just typically yellow in color, right? They're, they're covered in pollen, um, which contain those sperm. And then uh, what happens, hopefully for the, the tree, is that the, the pollen gets into the scales on the female uh, cone and fertilize it, right? And so if the uh, pine cone gets fertilized, then a seed results and it kind of flakes off of the scales and can then fly um, you know off somewhere else to hopefully give rise to a new tree. Um, a seed if you're curious is technically a new plant right a little embryo along with like a food supply and then it's covered by a coat and so it doesn't have to stay 
damp, right? Um, seeds can be dry and then they get uh, deposited um, and when they're then exposed to water, they can germinate, is what we call it, and a new plant can pop out. Now the angiosperms, we actually mentioned uh, flower anatomy back when we talked about Gregor Mendel, um, but the angiosperms are the flowering plants. And so they're going to have both male and female parts within the flower. Um, so just in, in review, the stamen uh, is the male, uh, or the stamens are the male parts of the flower. There's usually multiple stamens. Then you have what's called the carpal or pistil uh, located centrally. And there's usually just one of these. This is the female part with the ovary at its base. Um, and then what can happen is fertilization, right? Pollen from uh, the stamen can enter into this female part and fertilize an egg um, at the base. If that occurs, you get the development of a seed, and then you get the development of a fruit around that seed. Um, and so fruit is an evolutionary advancement of these angiosperms as well. Now the unique structures we see in angiosperms are really, really important. And those unique structures are uh, flowers and fruits. Right, now flowers with bright colors, with strong aromas, as you guys might know, uh, really uh, interesting shapes, these attract pollinators. Right? And so like this bee right here, which is covered in pollen, uh, the bee comes around to say, like, what is this flower, right? And then the pollen sticks to the bee, and the bee carries it to another flower and allows the plant to, again, kind of increase its range and allows um, sexual reproduction that way as well. Then we got fruit, right? Now, as many of you guys are probably fans of fruit, I like fruit. Um, really high in sugar content, right? So it has a good taste. Also has a lot of bright color, usually. And one thing that, that uh, a lot of animals do that humans don't always do is that when you eat, a, eat fruit, you ingest the seeds. Now, humans tend not to do this for digestive reasons, but other animals don't worry about that, right? They eat a whole apple or they eat watermelon and eat the seeds with it or whatever. And what happens is those seeds make their way through the animal and then come out in their poop, right? in their feces. But the thing is, if a bear eats an apple, it might be miles away by the time it poops that back out. And so again, it, it disperses the seeds, it increases the range of those plants. Also, just an interesting side note, fruits don't have to be like what you think of as, as you might eat. Um, fruits can be adapted for all sorts of things. So right now we got a lot of dandelions out there, right? Um, and, uh, you know, you probably see those dandelions first. They're like that yellowish flower, and then they form these little fuzz head things. Well, if you look really close, each little fuzzy thing is actually a fruit with a seed here at the, the base of it. So this dark thing here would be like our seed. Um, and the little part that flies in the wind is the fruit. Now, the flowering plants, we also break down further um, into two kind of groups. Again, this is sort of unofficial, um, but they're called the monocots and the dicots. Um, cotyledons, or seed leaves, are found within the seed, and they are sort of the first thing, one of the first things that pops out when the seed does sprout. Um, and so some seeds have one cotyledon, and some have two cotyledons. And so if the seed has one, we call it a monocot. And this includes tons of things, but just some examples here. Um, rice, corn, and wheat in terms of crop plants, but then also a lot of flowers that people like to, to grow um, are monocots. Dicots um, include a lot of trees, um, also some flowers, um, and then also some of our crop plants here as well. Last little thing, and don't spend a bunch of time memorizing this or anything, but I'll probably ask you a question about it or uh, coming up here on this little quiz we're going to have. One thing that's really interesting is you can tell a monocot from a dicot with a lot of different characteristics, some of which are very um, uh, external, right? So if you were just looking at a plant uh, when you were on a walk somewhere, you could sometimes figure out if it was a monocot or a dicot. So again, monocots have just one of these little seed leaves in their seed, 
But monocots also typically have uh, linear veins in their leaves. Um, if you cut open the, the stalk, you would see um, sort of like a random but complex arrangement of tubes or vascular bundles. Um, if you pulled a monocot, it would have a very fibrous root system, so it's a lot of fuzzy little roots. Um, and when you look at a flower, it usually has multiples of three. So it might have nine petals, might have three stamens, um, things like that. Whereas dicots, on the other hand, um, again, have two seed leaves, then they tend to have uh, branching or net-like veins in their leaves. So again, if you think of a lot of trees, you're going to see that sort of thing in the leaf structure. Um, they're going to have ring vascular bundles. Again, think of a tree has rings to it, right? And part of that is because of these vascular bundles. Um, they tend to have a taproot. So you can see here, it's like one big strong root with just some little offshoots from that. Um, and if you look at the flowers of dicots, they typically have multiples of four or five in their structures. So they might have eight petals. They might have 15 petals to the flower um, and things like that. So that wraps up all those different types of organisms. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, and uh, we'll take a look at some of this stuff on a quiz that'll come up next week.